Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to January 2019th. And I'm Susan Thornton and your host this evening from the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation for our first Facebook Live patient interview of the new year. So I hope everybody had a great holiday season and we're starting off with the second presentation in our series of three talking about topical treatments. And tonight, uh, our focus is going to be specifically on phototherapy, which I know is near and dear to many of us. And with us tonight, we have Dr. Aaron Mangold, who's joining from the Mayo Clinic in beautiful, sunny, and warm Scottsdale, Arizona, especially much warmer than here in Philadelphia for me. So welcome, Dr. Mangold. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, making sure that my feed is going all right. So I'll be discussing phototherapy, and I do have some disclosures. Um, I do actually investigate for multiple companies that use light-based therapy, specifically in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Um, I will not be discussing any of those today. I'll be talking about traditional phototherapy, and we'll be taking a, a bit of a journey understanding that people's backgrounds are quite variable. Some individuals might be seasoned veterans of having cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. Others maybe have a new diagnosis and are just starting the process and maybe want to learn more. So what I'll try to do is discuss the basics of phototherapy, why we do it, how it works potentially, talk about general approaches, really following most of what the guidelines recommend, and then I'll walk you through what we do in our phototherapy unit, really giving an example of how one might approach phototherapy. We'll talk a little bit about the side effects of phototherapy, both the short term, which will affect you um, in both the initial treatments as well as dose escalation, and then the longer term side effects. We'll discuss at the very end how you might taper down phototherapy or what some of the maintenance regimens are, because I think there is a little bit of variability there, not saying one person is right and another is wrong, but just variability, which you might hear from uh, expert to expert when you see them in consultation for mycosis fungoides. Starting with a bit of a definition of what is phototherapy? Phototherapy as it relates to dermatology and as it relates to the management of cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, specifically mycosis fungoides, is really talking about ultraviolet light. And you can see in the figure the different types of ultraviolet light, meaning the light that isn't seen, visible light you can see on the far right. Ultraviolet's really broken down into three different types. UVC, which you can see on the left, which is absorbed by the ozone layer, doesn't get to your skin. UVB, which goes through the ozone layer, gets absorbed by your skin, and goes down to the level of the epidermis. And I think that's something that's important to know. It goes to that top layer of skin, doesn't really seem to go much deeper. That's actually the type of light that causes sunburns. And uh, when we treat patients, which we'll talk about later, that UVB uh, dose is really going to be... Um, really dialed in based upon how much erythema you get it is actually not the dominant form of light. The dominant form of light is UVA, and which you can see on the figure is UVA passes through the ozone layer, will pass through the epidermis, and will actually even go down into the dermis. And these depths of penetration, we actually use to our own advantage when we treat patients using things like narrowband ultraviolet B for more superficial patch stage disease, using UVA-1, which is a type of UVA light, or what we call PUVA, which is sorolin, which is a photoactivating agent combined with UVA light for potentially refractory patch stage disease or for more advanced plaque or refractory plaque stage disease. The other form of light that was commonly used as broadband UVB, although that's really been uh, uh, supplanted by narrowband UVB, which is more effective and has less side effects overall. And in general, when you see most people, PUVA or sorolin plus UVA1 is actually kind of falling to a second line light therapy as well, which really narrowband UVB has become the, the workhorse for most dermatologists who treat a lot of mycosis fungoides. So how does phototherapy work? There was actually a, a question about this 
before that was sent in and someone had asked, well, UVB light doesn't kill T cells. So how is it working? And it only gets absorbed into the epidermis. So what is it really doing? I think it's a, it's a great question. And really there are two ways to look at how lights are working. One is that they're working directly on the cancer cells. The other is they're working on the environment in which the cancer cells live and disrupting that environment can actually lead to toxicity. So when we treat patients with UVB, we actually are disrupting that communication that's between the cancer cells and some of the other cells that live around them. And that disruption actually can lead to things like decreased cell survival, or it can lead to the cells themselves dying. We can also add other therapies in combination, as we discussed earlier, that sorolin, which is a, a chemical that's actually found in nature that makes you more sensitive to light. And when you use that with the UVA, you can actually induce uh, uh, toxicity or you can make the cells uh, uh, growth slowed and actually lead to enough um, uh, damage to the cell itself that it dies. One of the key things that I would point out though, with any of these mechanisms either that are working on the uh, malignant cells, the my, the, in, like mycosis fungoides, the malignant T cells, or they're working on the communicating cells, there's not as much specificity, meaning that the damage that's done is the damage that's done to both those cells as well as everything surrounding them. And we talk about long-term toxicities, some of that becomes important. The good thing is, is these T cells seem to be more sensitive in certain ways than other surrounding cells are. So the long-term tolerability or how well one can stay on this medication for many, many years is, is actually quite good. Patients will stay on phototherapy for sometimes even decades, depending upon how you dose it. When people undergo treatment in general, there are three phases we think about. The first phase is what we call the induction phase, and that's really where you're trying to titrate up the dose of lights, either UVA or narrowband UVB, to get a response. And you're really assessing how well can that individual tolerate the treatment, as well as how much efficacy or how effective is the treatment in them. In this phase, usually we start to see responses around a month, can take longer, but unlike things like psoriasis, where most of the light data is gathered from, mycosis fungoides specifically seems to be a bit more refractory to treatment. So sometimes that induction phase can be longer. The second phase is what we call the consolidation phase, and that's really where we're trying to maintain the individual on lights at the maximal uh, response dose, usually for about three months to, to say the disease looks stable, the patient is responding well, and then deciding when are we going to titrate things down to keep that response. And then we go directly into the third phase, which is the maintenance phase. And this is really characterized by having a goal of preventing relapse and maintaining the disease under control at the minimal possible dose. And we'll go over an example of how each of these phases works. So this is a protocol that we use on the right, and then kind of the general of how most centers in the United States approach phototherapy, which is really two to three treatments per week. The treatments should be separated by about 48 hours, and we'll, I'll explain why that is specifically with that redness caused by UVB or some of these delayed side effects that you can see when using phototherapy. Unless someone has a history of sensitivity in the sun, we usually use what are called skin types or Fitzpatrick types to decide based upon if you burn or tan and, um, and can really titrate in the starting dose as well as how quickly we increase that dose of light. The other important thing is shielding sensitive areas or areas that aren't affected. In general, eyes, nipples, and genitalia are shielded in order to protect them from both sunburn as well as long-term toxicity. If you look on the figure on the right, you can see an example of how we go through that initial dose. So picking it based upon either someone's skin type or doing what we call MED testing, which is minimal erythema dose. And that's a, a specific test where we expose the skin to various doses of light, determine what dose causes the patient to get red, and then we start at about 70% of that dose. 
That traditionally is not used though. More commonly now we just use the skin typing, which you can see on the left, starting with different doses of light, which correlate to how long you're standing in the box with that exposure time. And then as the patient follows up, increasing the dose over time, which you can see is roughly 10 to 20%. I don't know if, if you can see my arrow highlighting that. So roughly it ends up being about 10 to 20% per treatment that we go up. We do dose adjust though, depending upon side effects. So if there is no redness, we increase the dose. If there's mild redness, we often keep the dose the same. And if there's more moderate to severe redness, we often will either dose decrease if it's moderate, um, and then subsequently increase at a dose reduced amount, or we may hold it until that burn resolves, and then we can restart at a lower dose with a slower titration. The thing that you should keep in mind is you might burn initially with one dose, but over time you will get what we sometimes call hardened, where you can actually tolerate much higher doses of light. So you'll see adjustments being made either in the office or with your own home unit, depending upon how you tolerate that light over time. The frequency of treatment, which you can see lowers typically three times per week. And we do adjust uh, depending upon mistreatment. So life happens, people get busy, you may not be able to make that Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So typically what we'll do is, is adjust if it's outside of the range of a week. We may decrease by two treatments, which could be anywhere from 10 to 20% per treatment. Or if it's even further outside of a two week window, do more significant reductions. And if it's a month of mistreatment, we typically restart the treatments at that dosing based upon the skin type. One of the really nice things about phototherapy is it can be done in the home. And I think this is uh, uh, outside of it being uh, also a very cost effective therapy and highly effective therapy. This is another uh, really uh, a great thing about using lights. Some things I would outline is there can be differences between home light units and office light units. Um, not that price is everything, but the ones that we use in the office are uh, truly 360 uh, degree units. They uh, are highly maintained for certain levels of power with each uh, 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 exposure. We have a lot more control in the office and most large centers that do lights actually have someone who specializes in doing lights as our institution as we have a uh, a, what's called a light nurse who only does light therapy all day long. So they're really able to cater to that patient and really maximize the, um, the efficacy of the treatment. I would say no matter how you're doing, you should still have oversight from your dermatologist to both monitor for long-term toxicity as well as to ensure that you're at an adequate dose of lights. The last thing uh, that I would point out, not so much as something that should always concern you, but it's actually very difficult, if not impossible, to get Medicare to cover home light units. And this is something that you know is a potential point of collaboration, uh, which we, actually Susan and I were discussing before this um, live Facebook feed, of somewhere that we could collaborate with Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, as well as uh, uh, CMS and other service providers in order to uh, really get this, this uh, uh, approved in a streamlined fashion for individuals with cutaneous lymphoma. If you look on the right, you'll see that there are different types of units. The upper right is a 360 degree unit, which is the one we often use for um, MF. The upper left is a full body single panel unit, which you could imagine if you're in that unit, you've got to turn 50, you know, halfway through and do another exposure. So it does prolong your light exposure. And then for people with more focused disease, there are these smaller units and even handheld units that can be used, uh, can be used at home, really keeping in mind how much space you have as well for the unit. Some of the pearls of therapy uh, that I would focus in on really is uh, uh, that when you're utilizing light therapy, you're treating to your end goal. And I think with early stage MF, that end goal ideally is remission of disease, but realistically it's good disease control that keeps your symptoms minimal and really keeps your quality of life high. So there is some variability there. We usually see responses within the first month of treatment, but that doesn't mean we see maximal response. We may have to dose adjust 
and or add adjuvant therapies to get to that maximal response. One of the things that seems kind of straightforward, but maybe isn't, is you have to get lights on the areas for improvement. You will see some improvements in the blood with things like PUVA, but in general, you have to treat it to get it better. And then that same light, no pun intended, you also don't want to treat areas that may be more sensitive to light or areas that have classically never had disease. And some of the common things are covering things like the genitalia, the nipples, as I'd mentioned, the eyes should always be covered, as well as if maybe the head and neck isn't involved, you don't have to treat it with phototherapy. In general, early stage disease, like patch stage disease, responds quite well to lights, but 80% response rate when you take all comers. Obviously, there'll be people who don't respond and some people who have exceptional responses. Disease that's plaque stage or has more folliculotropic features or where the MF goes around the hair follicle tends not to respond as well. It maybe responds better to certain sorts of treatment. As we discussed earlier, that UVA or PUVA treatment will often work better with deeper disease, but that's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. Some patients with either plaque stage disease or folliculotropic MF may respond very, very well to traditional narrowband UVB. More frequent treatments may decrease the time to clearance, meaning that if you need to get better in a month for some event, increasing that treatment frequency from two to three times may help. Some institutions do do even more frequent treatments. However, there is a risk of burn with that rapid titration of treatment. And then the last point is that more advanced disease may require PUVA or additional systemic therapies, albeit there's not great evidence or there's not any really strong controlled trials that show that additional systemic treatments with lights increases efficacy. However, all of us who treat patients and patients themselves know that with the addition of certain systemic therapies to lights, such as oral retinoids, which would include things like exeritine or acetretin or seriotane, does improve their response with concomitant light therapy. Some of the potential side effects in the short term, the one we see the most is redness and sunburn. It's really important to remember what type of treatment you're getting. There's variability. So with narrow band UVB, typically your peak redness is in 12 to 24 hours. With PUVA treatment, it actually peaks a lot later. Or with UVA1 treatment at 48 to 96 hours, usually the redness resolves by a couple of days with UVB, narrow band UVB, and can take up to a week with PUVA. Based upon this, it's really where that 48 hour titration comes from. You want patients to really exhibit the pink peak of erythema before we treat them again in order to uh, prevent the development of toxicity in the skin. Other short-term side effects including uh, include burning, paritis, and stinging on the skin. This is actually very common. There are certain ways to actually improve these symptoms. The first is emoliating the skin. We know that light therapy dries the skin out. There is some improvement with moisturization. The other is dose adjustment, so you can decrease the dose while you're, while you're treating it initially in order to minimize therapies. Or if it's tolerable, this often does improve with time as the skin, as I was saying earlier, kind of hardens or darkens and becomes a bit more um, uh, tolerant of phototherapy. PUVA itself can lead to immediate darkening of the skin, which can sometimes take patients off guard. And one we see specifically out in Arizona where it is quite hot during the summertime is lightheadedness in the box where it's more of an overheating or if your conditioning maybe isn't as good as you want it to be, standing in the box can um, be both uh, 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 consuming of energy as well as it can be quite hot. Um, we specifically have a, a very uh, customized exhaust units that we use in our light boxes to try to keep them extra cool, but it can be variable with, with, with temperature. And that's one I think I highlighted because patients will be very surprised at their intolerability based upon lightheadedness. Some of the long-term side effects specifically with PUVA therapy are skin cancers. So individuals we see with long-term treatment greater than 250 treatments will be at an elevated risk of skin cancer. It's not a guarantee that you'll get one, but it is something that you should be aware of, as well as should probably be discussed in the office before starting. When we talk a little bit about maintenance therapy at the end as well, um, I can tell you my preferences and we can go over why you might want to titrate down based upon this fact. We do see modeling of skin color with 
both types, UVA and UVB therapy on the skin. PUVA leads to very um, distinct freckles on the skin. And then one of the important ones is eye damage. So we always want individuals wearing eye protection when they're in the booth. With PUVA itself, that first 24 hours, it's really critical not just to protect your eyes while in the booth, but also to protect your eyes for, for the time being when you're out and about because that sorolin stays around in your body and can lead to damage, which can predispose to cataracts. The good thing is when you look at the data, we don't see a lot of cataracts because we do a good job of prevention, which is uh, uh, kudos to everyone listening in who does phototherapy or does PUVA for wearing good eye protection after treatment and um, keeping themselves protected. Narrowband UVB typically just affects more of the surface of the eye. It doesn't go as deep, so it really just has more itching on the surface or redness of the eye. Again, we always protect the eyes to prevent this. The last thing that we'll talk about is a maintenance phase. And this is one where I think you may see some variability. I provided a figure on the right, which is from the most recent consensus going over how do we do this. And I think really the caveat that should be, should be uh, uh, front and forward is there's really no clear evidence that maintaining somebody or keeping them on some low dose treatment or infrequent treatment actually increases the time to relapse, meaning it keeps you under control longer. The small studies that have been done have been not very well controlled, really have been retrospective analysis with variable uses of lights that haven't shown one to be better than the other. There is a caution that I would say when you're going beyond 10 to 12 days of treatment, specifically with narrowband UVB, there is a risk of getting a burn. So we actually decrease the dose. And you'll see that in the figure on the right, where we decrease the dose by about 25% when we're at two weeks. Decisions of when do you go into a maintenance phase versus when do you just stop and retreat if your disease recurs is really dependent upon the individual. So if you're someone who's doing PUVA, has a history of skin cancers, you may be more inclined to just go on the, let's just go with intermittent treatment at time of relapse. Um, whereas if you're someone who has disease that was very hard to get under control, you may feel more comfortable staying on some maintenance regimen in the long term. The good thing is individuals who initially respond to ultraviolet therapy often respond to retreatment. I can say from my own experience, I tend to not use as many long-term maintenance phases. I tend to treat retreat just because of my patient's lifestyles and preferences. It's easier for them to not be so beholden to the light box. But for other individuals, it's definitely their preference to stay with some long-term, you know, every 10-day treatment or just a weekly treatment or something like that. The last slide is just going over the summary again. So phototherapy is a safe and effective treatment for early stage mycosis fungoides. The typical treatment regimen is two to three times per week for induction, about three months of consolidation or maintenance at that highly responsive dose, and then a maintenance phase where the dose is titrated down, or alternatively, the, the treatment is stopped, restarted at disease recurrence. Narrowband UVB is the most common form of phototherapy. It's highly efficacious for patch stage disease. For more advanced plaque or refractory patch stage disease, you may find some advantage of utilizing PUVA or combinations of light therapy with topicals or systemic therapy. So with that, I'm going to go back to Susan and we'll take some questions. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure people have questions. So while Mike is... Um, Kind of working on on all of that. I had a few that popped into my mind. Um, you know, a lot of folks may get their primarily UVB treatments not at a, a major center. You know, it sounds like you know in your photo th phototherapy center, you've really got um, you know you've got a specialized nurse. You've got people that really understand this disease and how it gets treated. But for some folks, and I know that was my experience at one point. You know, I I found a, a dermatology practice that delivered light treatment, um, but they didn't know anything about cutaneous lymphoma, but it was closer to work, it was easier to get to, those kinds of things. Do you have any tips or things that people need to take with them if they go to a center that maybe doesn't have the depth of experience or um, kind of the daily practice in, in treating cutaneous lymphoma patients? Are there things that people should um, 
talk to that particular dermatologist or whomever's delivering the, delivering the treatment as far as, as um, just to make sure they don't get burned. Because I do hear a lot of stories of people saying, oh, they, that I got burned. They didn't seem to mm -hmm. really understand. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. I think it's a it's a really great question. It's something that um, most referral centers really are are challenged with every day. From my perspective, I often try to work with with the individual provider. So if I am able to see someone in consultation, what we'll often do is either some sort of kind of check step follow up, or I'll have my light nurse work directly with that individual's office, walking them through how we treat these patients and how we titrate the dose up. I see it actually go on both sides though, Susan, where I have individuals who come, who come back and they say, well, I was burned with lights, I don't wanna do that again. Or I'll have individuals that come back six months later and say, my lights don't work, and we find out that they're on, the, on a dose that is um, much lower than needed. The thing I would say for the average dermatologist who has light units, the majority of how we learned how to use lights in mycosis fungoides was based upon psoriasis. So yeah. some of it is as simple as getting that provider comfortable with treating the individual of saying, look, this is like psoriasis with some caveats, obviously. Treatments take a little bit longer. The individuals who are more red may be more photosensitive. The age demographic, I think, might actually be one of the, the most important differences where the individuals with MF tend on average to be a bit older in really kind of working with them to come up with some sort of treatment regimen. I think that the, 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 the point you bring up may be a broader issue there where we see because of either insurance coverage or because of the more rampant use of systemics, and not that that's a bad thing, that the art of phototherapy is actually becoming a dwindling one, um, where there's not as much incentive to provide phototherapy. So, you know, you really have to identify, even in an area of, you know, six million people where I practice, there's still only a handful of people doing a lot of phototherapy, which is kind of unbelievable in a way. So um, it is difficult. I would say for the individuals who are getting lights, if they feel like they're not responding, there are pretty clear guidelines of how do we titrate up, where are the doses we start at, and you can request a second opinion. It's possible that your disease is refractory to treatment. The other possibility is you may need a higher dose of treatment. Um, and if you're in a pinch, um, you can always contact one of those institutions directly. Some of them do provide, I know we provide e-consultations for some things uh, to provide some guidance to those providers. That's a great, that's, thank you for that. And I think that gives people some guidance. Um, always good to seek out the opinion of an expert in the field, even if the treatment itself is delivered locally, you know, having that kind of collaborative effort I think really creates the, the best of all worlds, you know, getting treatment delivered closer to home, which may be easier for people to get to, especially if you're doing something like light three times a week. Um, but having the expertise of someone who really does this all the time and sees a lot of patients with this disease. Um, uh, uh, another question. So, oh, here we go. Um, go ahead, Mike, pop that back up on the screen. Um, what type of phototherapy works best for early stage? I think in common, in practice, narrowband UVB. Narrowband UVB is far and away the most commonly used treatment. The depth of penetration seems to be quite good. The long-term safety data really based from psoriasis with tens of thousands of patient hours of exposure doesn't seem to have much cancer risk outside of potentially the anogenital area. Um, it's the workhorse for most providers. I think PUVA is one that in certain institutions is still used quite a bit, but overall, if you look across most of the centers in the United States, is still kind of falling in a, in a far second line treatment. I know in our institution, for example, we utilize rather than PUVA, a lot of UVA1 with combinational systemics, and then we will use PUVA in those patients who, who do well. 
really with the mechanism, we see longer remissions with PUVA, which is one of the things we like, or less frequent dosing. Um, mm. But the, the damage done by PUVA, it's not insignificant. And you, you know someone who's been on PUVA for a long time, immediately when they walk through the door from that long-term photo damage, um, whether or not you would say it's more effective, I think is a little bit of a difficult question because there's never been a study to compare the two head to head. Um, I would say they're probably, they're both very effective treatments, but, uh, if it were me, I was going into be seen for early stage MF, I would do narrow band UVB. Great, great answer. Um, okay. Well, phototherapy work for the scalp. Very good question. <laughs> It, it will if you can get the light there. Um, there are certain types of light combs that can be used, and we use these for MF on the scalp. We also use these for other inflammatory diseases on the scalp. The one downside of utilizing light combs is that they are quite expensive, so you may spend as much money on a light comb as you do a full body unit. The other problem with a light comb is you actually have to comb your hair for quite a while. And the exposure time, I think, is a little bit more difficult, a little bit less standardized. Um, but you, you can utilize lights on the scalp. Um, probably a bit easier in our individuals who are uh, uh, less um, blessed with a lot of hair. Um, the other thing, though, I think is, is a nice corollary to that, though. As I said earlier, it seems a bit maybe silly in a way, but light where it goes works better. So special sites often need to have special treatment. And one of the issues that we see a lot of problems with is the scalp, as well as the palms and soles, where it's difficult to get that dose right. And if you get a really bad burn on your hands or feet, say if you're uh, either erythrodermic, which is a very tenuous group to treat, or if you just happen to have really bad MF on your hands and feet, the dosing can be difficult, but you have to do an extra dose either at the, usually at the end of treatment um, and be very careful with dosimetry so that you don't overdose on the hands and feet and, and, and end up with a, um, a, a bad sunburn on them. Mm, right, all right. Someone says, can I just go in the sun and get the same kind of UV exposure? Always a good question. Yeah. Um, short answer is you could. Um, long answer is I probably wouldn't. Um, the reason that these units work so well, when you look at the spectrum of light, UVB makes up about 5% of light. UVA makes up about 95%. We think of a lot of the carcinogenic or cancer-causing properties of light as being associated with UVB. That's why within more modern treatments of narrowband, we really isolate down to a very small wavelength of light that we don't see as one of the common cancer-causing um, wavelengths. What we can do then is we can increase the dose tremendously. So you can get a dose of, of, of effective therapeutic light avoiding a lot of that toxicity. And what you'll notice is individuals, if they have been getting sun exposure, will have less MF in those areas of uh, uh, sun exposure, but often they don't see the responses with that narrow band or with even UVA, for example. So have I recommended that to patients? Sure, but that's only with very unique scenarios where we, go through the, the uh, very you know, serious and real discussion that regular tanning bed boosts, they give you those light levels or so to sun exposure, but not to the level with, um, with which we see um, uh, in the units either at home or in the office. Um, and there's really not a great uh, correlation between the two. So if you go into one tanning bed unit, I don't know what the dose you're getting if you go to another tanning bed unit. And some of the UVA, UVB balance can be very different. Um, so it, it, it's quite hard to use, I think, and to be you know, therapeutically sound. Yeah, so the, the general consensus is light therapy under the guise of an expert is best if, you know, all, all things considered and that works. So that's your best mm -hmm. bet. Um, should I avoid the sun while getting phototherapy treatment? I think in general, yes, uh, being reasonable, of course, though, uh, with PUVA itself, 
of course, the first 24 hours, you still have the sorolin in your body. You need to be very careful with sunlight exposure. With narrowband UVB, I think it, you have to really show caution when you're in the sun, but you know, normal sun protection that we would, we would advise individuals to have. And the biggest issue there is that we don't want to affect our dosing of the medication based upon additional sun exposure. So you get treatment, you go out in the sun for 10 hours after that, get a blistering sunburn, we're kind of hitting the reset button on the skin. And it's not like we're doing that at the gain of efficacy. We're just doing that really at the gain of toxicity. So I would say the normal sun precautions would be advised outside of PUVA. With PUVA, it's strict sun avoidance for that 24 hours while you're still on the medication, keeping yourself covered up. And also the interesting thing that uh, maybe didn't come across when I was speaking is that the UVA, because of its wavelength, will go through things. So if you do PUVA and you have consumed sorolin, even if you're sitting in front of the window in your house, UVA is actually going right through that window unless you have a very specific type of tint on it and will be activating the sorolin itself. So it's something that yeah. not everybody thinks of, oh, I'm gonna be in my car, so I don't need to keep myself covered up. If you're on a UVA-based treatment or PUVA treatment, um, you can get transmittance right through the glass, which will uh, lead to a potential toxicity. Hmm. Wow, good to know. So just in general, good sun protection, no matter what you're doing. Always mm -hmm. a good rule of thumb. Um, who is most eligible for phototherapy treatment? Guessing maybe, so, you know, which, which disease, which stage, that kind of thing. Yeah, really where phototherapy seems to be kind of the, the workhorses with early stage disease. So 1A through 2A, understanding that in the 2A disease, whatever low level of nodal disease is there is probably not going to go away with light treatment. Um, in my practice, it's really focused in on 1A, 1B disease. If it's anything higher than that, we're usually adding some other their treatment on top of it. Most common treatments topically would be either corticosteroids. Uh, Valcor can be used, understanding that it you know, also has a, a toxicity on the skin, um, which, which may be exacerbated with lights um, or oral retinoids. So you know, the cost-conscious person probably is using soriotane with lights, older drug, quite a bit cheaper. The one that's FDA approved, as, as, as everybody may or may not know, is bexerotene, but you're looking at a price tag where you can add probably two to three zeros on the end in cost. So really deciding between those. We do see, at least um, amongst uh, expert anecdotal experiences, that UV therapy with things like bexerotene for folliculotropic MF actually seems to be a really uh, effective combination that might spare that individual from going to more more advanced aggressive therapies um, or therapies that may be more um, uh, toxic to the immune cells in general. Right, right. Okay, uh, will I have side effects from phototherapy? I think you talked about some of the possible ones, but um, maybe you can just run through them again. And they're probably very yeah. individualized, right? It is. Um, I think it's dependent upon the institution too, and it's also de dependent upon the individual. So, you know, when I talk with patients about this, if your goal is to, you know, get to that point where you're having maximal efficacy of therapy, we can titrate the dose up faster. That's at the risk of increased toxicity, though. If you're an individual who's, you know, risk averse and says, look, I know that in all, in all likelihood, I'm going to have mycosis fungoides for the rest of my life, and I'm seeing this as a marathon, that slower incremental increase decreases that risk of toxicity. Additionally, if you're someone who displays signs of photosensitivity or is concerned about potential diseases of photosensitivity, we can test for that and do that MED testing, which allows us to be a bit more methodical um, or a bit more uh, um, uh, precise in our approach to how we dose the lights. But as I tell most of my patients, as Richard Feynman said, there's no such thing as free lunch. So, you know, we always run these risks. What we do with anyone we treat, regardless of stage of mycosis fungoides, is we match the disease as it affects quality of life 
and as it affects more, you know, mortality or morbidity, we match those to a treatment for that individual. We don't have the algorithms that you see with, you know, a uh, heart attack where they come in, if they're in this category, they get this, or in that category, they get that. Of course, we have guidelines, and in the guidelines is a bunch of experts getting together saying do this or do that, um, but it, it, it's individualized uh, at so many levels because we really, for the most part, don't have great data that says we're deviating outcome, right? We don't know how an early stage person is going to do in 20 years. So how do we know if we're prolonging their life? We know if we can improve their quality of life and we know risk factors. So that's really what we're monitoring for and we're treating the individual. Right, right. Okay, is phototherapy the best choice for a child with patch stage? Good question. I think that is a good question. It would depend upon quite a few factors, I think. So um, children often get more indolent or non-aggressive forms of, of MF. They often present with uh, what could be hypopigmented or light colored patches on their skin. And the treatments that you're gonna wanna use again in a child is minimizing toxicity and maximizing uh, efficacy and improving quality of life. So if it's early 1A disease that's in relatively small patches, that's something that topical treatments might actually be quite effective for. If it's more generalized patch stage disease, it may be hard in a child to apply topicals all over. So I think if you're looking between those two, topicals would be ones that either um, keep the immune system functional um, or don't deplete out immune cells topically. Or if it's phototherapy, it's ones that don't have long-term cancer risk. So for me personally, PUVA's out the window for almost any kid um, because there is that potential risk there that is very real with early exposure. And I think this would be another one as I was talking about maintenance. Once you get the child under control where you have that discussion of, is this someone that we want to continue to expose to ultraviolet light? Or is this someone that we want to do breaks and retreatments that may coincide with certain things in their life? So for kids often, if they have certain breaks where we know we can get good treatment and we can get you know, uh, a nice response for maybe six months or eight months, we may treat over the summer or we may treat in certain patterns that allow them to be a kid. Um, that's one of the hard things with phototherapy is with anybody is accommodating to that, you know, three times a week treatment. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually can be quite disruptive if you have to travel or can't do it at home. Um, but I do think it's, it's, it's a, a, a very good therapy. There are other therapies that we use. Like I said, topicals would also be, re be reasonable, but in children, we approach them with under the understanding that it's unlikely their disease is going to progress overall and we really need to be cautious about long-term toxicity yeah, and i would think that depending upon the child could they stand in the light box yeah. a by themselves and you know be okay um you know one of the other considerations depending upon upon their age and um kind of attention span <laughs> right yeah, yeah, so course. other things to take into consideration um, does MF progress to get worse if you have patches and choose not to treat? Always a good question. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Really to, you know, understand that question, um, I think you have to step back a little and try to understand what we know about the disease itself, which is that we're still trying to figure out what the right risk factors are for progression. And if you look in late stage disease as of, uh, as of the last few years, we have more and more evidence or what are the high risk features, you know, patients who have a certain elevated inflammatory marker in their blood, if they have advanced stage disease, if they're older, if they have things like transformed disease, those are really seen as late stage risk factors. We know that individuals who present early with not aggressive disease tend not to progress. And we know that there's a subset of early patients, albeit uncommon, that do present with progressive disease. But we don't know all of the key mechanisms of how you go from that early stage to that advanced disease. And we also don't know if our treatments are changing that. We like to think that they are, um, but we really have a poor understanding of that. So when you add all of that up to say, if I leave it untreated, 
is it going to progress? And from what we know about MF, I would think it makes it more likely that it will. What we look of, what we look at in advanced disease, and even some of the um, more uh, research-based approaches, is if you get to what we call minimal residual disease, or even when we look from a technical standpoint at molecular cures, those patients actually tend not to relapse as much. So the less disease that's there is indicative of less chance of relapse. Now. Um, is that going to hold true in every individual? Well, we don't know. We, we can't pick that person who's going to progress and that person who's not going to uh, uh, progress and compare how they do over time. Um, if we could do that, then we could answer that question directly. I would say um, on the flip side of the coin, if you ask most any experts in MF, they say, you treat to keep the disease under control and better disease control, better patient does. Um, but what exactly we're doing, I think it's a, um, it's a really great question. Um, and some patients we have with other diseases, not all as MF, but some patients with other indolent skin lymphomas that are small, other health issues say, I don't want to do anything. And we monitor them very closely. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that, um, based upon what we know and more importantly, what we don't know, I think it's a reasonable approach if you're well informed. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And I think also, you know, it's such an individual decision. Um, and I know I've talked to, to folks that have maybe uh, patches and <clears throat> they're and they don't seem to do anything differently and they're fine having the patches. And then other people that don't want to have anything showing on their skin that's just um, how they've, they've, deal with having this disease. So, you know, being in treatment is really important for them. Um, mm -hmm. So, and it's such an individual decision. Um, and I think it's, that's where that uh, having a good relationship with your, your specialists and having those kinds of conversations and weighing the risks and, um, you know, what works best for you as an individual, given where you are in your disease and kind of what, what's going on in your life um, in order to make the right decision for you at any yeah, given I, point in time, which, you know, could always change because we just don't know. Yeah, I think that especially too, when you look even at the last annual um, meeting we had for the cutaneous, main cutaneous lymphoma group in the United States, quality of life is one of the important things. And, um, there is variability there based upon what sort of um, morbidity you have, if you have significant itch, if you have disease in areas mm. that is um, uh, ostracizing in some way or makes the individual feel uncomfortable. And we do titrate treatments. I can tell you I have patients who have disease that are on systemics that you might say, why are they on systemics? And it's really matching that. There is, ref there is refractory patch stage disease, very, very hard to get rid of. And you might increase your, um, uh, the, the, the tolerance of toxicity of a medication if it's, if it's to benefit some of those other things like severe intractable itch or like mm. having disease on your central face. Um, so we do work, obviously, to individualize the, the treatment protocol. And, you know, as some of the, if there's anyone who watches this or is listening who sees me, you know, really the bookends I give people when I see them for treatment of mycosis fungoides is we really know that there's only potentially one wrong thing to do. And that's if you come in to indiscriminately give you multi-agent chemotherapy. Mm. Um, beyond that, there can be an argument made for a lot of different treatments. And light therapy specifically falls into that, you know, minimal toxicity, very safe, good for early stage generalized disease. And we work our way up from there, adding therapies that a lot of people will say, you know, first preserve the immune system, preserve quality of life, and then as disease gets more aggressive and advanced, start to push into targeted systemic therapies and then cytoreductive therapies. But, you know, there isn't a right or wrong answer outside of, you know, one trial that had been done in 1989 that said maybe don't do that, you know? Right, right. And I know, let's see, I'm still confused. We're not getting to the root of the problem, are we? The cancer is in the lymphocytes in the blood. We're just treating the skin. 
Please help with more information if you would. Thank you so much. It's a good question, and I know it's very confusing when you think about it. It's like, what? The disease shows up in the skin, but it's in the blood, but it's the T cells. How does this all work? Yeah, I, I, you know, one of the things I think that's really critical to understand is that this disease isn't of all T cells. It's of a very specific type of T cell that really sets up shop in the skin. So in general, when you think about immune cells and you think about lymphocytes, you know, the two types of lymphocytes we think about are T and B cells. And as I tell patients, T cells protect against in general infections on the inside and they operate in um, uh, cancer surveillance and B cells protect against infections on the outside of cells. And they can go awry, both types can. But depending upon how far down the road those T cells have decided what they want to be, it really determines where they want to live. And the thing with cutaneous T cell lymphoma is that these are not, probably not totally differentiated, but fairly differentiated T cells that want to be in the skin. They, they express things that allow them to survive well in the skin. They express things that kind of tell them like the zip code of what neighborhood to go in. And it takes time and a lot of other mutations and right signals that almost teach those cancer cells to not want to be in the skin. So it is difficult, I think, when you look at the disease to say, well, aren't the cells in the blood? Yeah, I'm sure if you went through and sequenced to a very, very high fidelity, you would find some of them, but they don't want to be there. They want to be in the skin, just as a pigment cell, a melanocyte, wants to be in the skin. We know that if you actually look, those cells will migrate in the blood as well, but they don't survive very well. And that's why we treat individuals based upon the pathology and based upon how they do over time, because of the disease wanting to be there, we treat the bulk of the disease where it is. Could we treat the blood as well and clear that out? Sure we could, but you have to remember that we're, we're doing that at the expense of the majority of the T cell population that isn't cancer, and that's actually really helping keep the disease under control. So we prefer to use things that return what we call homeostasis rather than trying to clear everything out and hit the reset button. Right. Hopefully that, hopefully that helps. Um, so someone asks, how do you deter early stage? Good question. We didn't really yeah, go I into think staging. We, on there this is one, variability. But... Early stage in general is, is, is going to be defined as stage 2A or less. And um, 2A disease, for those of you who don't know much about the staging, is really going to be uh, if you have um, skin involvement that's going to involve a larger amount of your body surface area and early nodal disease, not advanced lymph node disease. Whereas 1B is going to be that same higher amount of skin involvement without any nodal disease. And 1A is going to be a minimal amount of skin disease without having any nodal disease. Um, how do we know someone has that? That's where I think there can be some variability. With early stage disease, um, what we've learned is that the amount of other areas that you could have involved, albeit you know, very low blood level involvement, or um, some minimal disease in a lymph node or something like that um, is dependent upon how hard you look. So certain techniques are much more sensitive to detect some of these things. And um, we're at a little bit of an, uh, 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 at a steep learning curve where we're trying to figure out what to do with those. So you may see when you go in to see somebody who has, uh, uh, who, who manages uh, lots of cutaneous lymphomas, you may see that they recommend certain diagnostic tests, certain scans, blood exams, things like that. And I think in that early stage group, as we're talking about, there's quite a bit of variability. Whereas in the advanced stage group, basically everyone is evaluating for those. Um, so you might see some kind of um, varying approaches. And I think as long as the, is the individual treating you explains why they're doing that, it's, it's reasonable. But in general, like I said, having less skin disease, uh, not being red head to toe, and having minimal nodal disease would be what's classified as early stage disease. Great, so we have time for two more questions. Um, so here's the penultimate question. Uh, can light therapy be used in conjunction with triamcinolone topical therapy? 
Good question. Or other steroids, right? Because that's a topical steroid we often use. Yeah, it can be. Um, is there strong evidence that using those two together increases efficacy? No. Um, one of the things, at least it's my own uh, um, not opinion, but one of the things I think about in theory is how these drugs work, right? So light therapy is going to have toxicity to the cancer cells, and it's also going to disrupt how those cancer cells talk to other cells in the environment. Topical steroids work in some ways similarly because they can directly kill the cancer cells, but they also deplete out the other immune cells around them. Um, so some people don't like that combination of utilizing topicals and lights that both are kind of immune depleting in a way or can be more significantly immune depleting. And they might prefer other mechanisms of toxicity. So as we add sorolin, for example, to UVA to increase toxicity, utilizing some other thing like, like a, a valchlor with lights to increase toxicity or a systemic um, like methotrexate potentially because you can increase toxicity with lights. Um, I don't think it's wrong. I think it's actually a very common practice. And the reality is, is that you're probably going to get faster time to response with steroids combined with lights. There's no strong evidence that says you're going to have any long-term poor outcomes or some theoretical issues. And I think the other major issue, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, is cost of medications. Steroids, for the most part, are quite cheap. And if they you know, increase your response or decrease the morbidity of disease, and potentially prevent you from having to go to additional more toxic agents. I think there's a significant advantage in doing that, um, as well as also uh, being really relatively cost conscious. So personally, I don't have any issue with it. Um, I think that there are other combinations that might work a little bit better. I'm more of a, a oral retinoid light person myself. I think you get a very strong boosted response to either uh, UVB with, with seriatine or bexeratine. Good point. All right, our last question. Um, my son has MF, he's 15, and do therapy three times a week. Would you include him in that kid's range you were talking about? Wow, that's, you know, teenager, hmm. I would. I, I think that really where you're looking at um, uh, kids, really the, the biggest concern isn't isn't necessarily their age, it's the amount of time that they're going to live with the disease and you know someone who's 15 now is probably going to have a, a life expectancy in, in nearly 90 or 100 years old and the what we know is that that ultraviolet exposure not necessarily from uh, phototherapy but in general from life experiences about 50 percent of that is acquired within the first 18 years of life and i think you do have to be very um careful in how you treat them. I don't think you want to be overly aggressive and increase some of that potential long-term toxicity with treatments in someone who has more indolent disease, where um, there may be some advantage of treating more gently and even allowing the individual, I mean, 15, I think, is an age where they should also be able to make some decisions in their treatment and understanding because ultimately they're going to be dealing with a lot of these long-term issues. And um, I find with kids, one of the most important things to address is, is social stigmas with them and in getting them either um, comfortable with their disease or at a disease level that makes them feel uh, less, less self-conscious. And that's one thing that I have to give uh, a major, major uh, kudos to the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation for is me telling a 15 year old, this is the potential disease course and this is what can happen is often not nearly as well taken as another 15 year old telling them, hey, I've had MF for three years and this is how I've done. You find the level of ease with which that, that, that individual has with the disease is totally different. And we do that within our own uh, uh, community out here where we try to connect some individuals that I see in clinic, similar age demographic, similar disease or disease at different, different uh, time points and really try to get them comfortable with the disease. Um, I guess backtracking to the question of 15 year old, yeah, I would still throw them into that group. I would encourage them to try to meet other young individuals with the disease as well. Yeah, very good point. 
and uh, we do our best to try to connect people and to provide opportunities and hopefully going forward we can do more of that and using technology and all that kind of good stuff so well that that we end are ending right on time and uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Mangold for joining us tonight I always learn something new and I loved your diagrams and I, I really appreciate your taking the time to go through kind of a really in-depth on phototherapy really um, appreciate all of that and for those of you who may be watching this later um, or you want to come back and watch it again um, it'll be live it'll be up on our YouTube channel um, give us a couple of days